And thank you very much for this kind introduction. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me to this very beautiful city. I really enjoy to be here in Thessaloniki. And uh, today I want to talk about diabetic nephropathy. It's a very broad theme, and so I thought I would give you an update, both for diagnostic issues and also some treatment strategies. And there is really hope at the horizon that we can really improve treatment and prevent the progression of nephropathy to an end-stage disease. Why it's not working? Okay. So what is diabetic nephropathy, if we want to uh, tell in a nutshell? So it can, diabetic nephropathy can be characterized by a persistent albuminuria higher than 300 milligrams per day or 300 milligrams per gram creatinine, a relentless decline, a constant decline in glomerular filtration rate, typically around 12 mils per min, like 12%, but there's a range between 2 and 20 per year. Most of the time, a raised arterial blood pressure and, what is most important, enhanced cardiovascular mobility and mortality. These are the characteristics of a diabetic nephropathy. Diabetic nephropathy develops not in all patients, but 20 to 30 percent of patients with type 1 or two, type 2 diabetes. And we heard today that there are clusters of patients which may predispose to uh, develop nephropathy. And it would be very interesting to identify those to target these patients with specific treatments. Diabetic nephropathy is the single most case of end-stage renal disease. And in many centers worldwide, 25 to 45% of the patients undergoing dialysis have diabetic nephropathy as underlying cause. So it's very common. So histologically, there are characteristic findings. So you can see these chemosteel Wilson lesions, these um, high, uh, material deposited like uh, nodules, you can see in the overview, we have a mesangial expansion and thickening of the basement membrane. So diabetic nephropathy can be diagnosed using a biopsy, but we don't prefer to do a biopsy. In the arterial wall, you can see hyalinosis, also deposition, and also in the efferent and afferent arteriole, altering the, the hemodynamics uh, of uh, kidney function. And also, when there is um, advanced disease, we have um, characteristical findings of glomerulosclerosis, protein casts, tubular atrophy, and in atrophy that means there are wide lumen, uh, flattened epithelial, and interstitial fibrosis. So there are characteristic findings which uh, can be seen in diabetic nephropathy. Most of the time, we don't make a biopsy and we diagnose diabetic nephropathy by by the presence of progressive proteinuria and GFR decline in the light of long-standing diabetes and hypertension. We also often see enlarged kidneys, absence of microhematuria, this is very important, and absence of a dominant low molecular proteinuria, which could hint for, which could point to a tubular disease. As I said, kidney biopsy is not routinely performed, but we reserve it for patients where we want to exclude another disease in addition to diabetic nephropathy, as, such as glomerulonephritis or others. So how we, can we screen for diabetic nephropathy? The gold standard of urinary proteins is still the albumin. It has 69 kilodalton and is normally withheld by the healthy glomerulus. And by any disease, an increased permeability will result in increased albuminuria. That means albuminuria is, reflects glomerular damage with high sensitivity and specificity. So it's actually a very ideal laboratory marker because normally the glomerular filtration barrier is tight. So best we measure it using an immunological method and we, we should express, express the result as an albumin creatinine ratio to, to correct for the dilution. And the cutoff for diabetic nephropathy is higher than 300 milligrams per gram creatinine. The range 30 to 300 would indicate what we call macroalbuminuria and would indicate incipient diabetic nephropathy. 
If you don't have an immunological assay, you can still use a urine dipstick, but beware of the dilution of the urine because this test will not uh, correct for the dilution. So if you, see, if you see a trace amount, then the sensitivity to detect, detect albuminuria is 44%. So it is not able to detect the very early stages, but if there is established um, albuminuria greater than 300, then the sensitivity increases up to 75% but it's still not the, as good as the immunological method. And there are also urine dipsticks for albuminuria, but they have not been used very, they have not been spread in the clinical routine. So factors associated with albuminuria. You can see that albuminuria associates with, with, with glycemic control, with blood pressure, with lower GFR, with smoking, with AIDS, so with all factors which are with all factors which are associated with increased mortality. So albuminuria is also indicative of uh, increased mortality because it's also associated with these each factors. So it reflects some cow of uh, endothelial health. So diabetic nephropathy, as all nephropathies, are staged in G and A stages. G according to the GFR, measured with serum creatinine, one two, through five, and the A stages reflecting albuminuria. An A3 stage would be higher than 300 and would indicate overt nephropathy here. So we, and the diagnosis should read as chronic kidney disease stage 3B, A3, due to diabetic nephropathy. So we should also add a cause. So why is this staging so important if we have any patient with kidney disease? We can stage the patient and we can have a risk stratification and we can see that chronic kidney disease is based on two dimensions of disease, GFR stage and albuminuria and this determines the mortality risk and stage um, the risk to the progression to end stage disease and these factors, they are also additives. That means a patient with high proteinuria and low GFR, they have, have a higher risk. So both in, in both dimensions, the risk increases, and these together are increased additively. So it's important to, to stage the patient, to analyze, to see his risk, and the patient in the red area are the high risk patients. Maybe they should be followed more thoroughly and more often. The association with, with reduced GFR and mortality in diabetic nephropathy was analyzed in a big meta-analysis with around one million patients, and it could confirm that a lower GFR increases the risk of mortality. In diabetics, the curve is shifted upwards. That means they have a higher risk of mortality at the same GFR, but the, 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 the relation stays the same. If the diabetic people are referenced to diabet uh, diabetes, diabetic people with a no normal GFR, then this in shift was vanished. That means within the diabetics, the association with low GFR and mortality is the same. This is the association of albuminuria and mortality. You can see that with increasing albuminuria, you have a linearly a linear increase in mortality risk. Diabetics have a higher risk for each level of albuminuria, but if you reference the, the diabetics to a diabetic with normal albuminuria, then this is also, this uh, shift is lost. That means the direction of albuminuria indicating increased risk is the same in diabetics as is it, is it in non-diabetics. Also the risk for the association of GFR with the risk of end-stage renal disease. So the lower the GFR, the higher the risk for end-stage renal disease. And it's also higher in diabetics and the, the direction is the same. And also for the association of albuminuria with the risk for ESRD in diabetic nephropathy, the higher the albuminuria, also for diabetics, the higher the risk for developing end-stage renal disease. And that's why we should stage the, the patients. So this is also very impressive that proteinuria 
is highly predictive of renal survival. That means the survival of the kidney in terms of dialysis-free stage. And if the proteinuria is higher than three grams per day, in this study, almost 100% of the patients developed end-stage renal disease and had to be dialyzed or suffered even death. So very high proteinuria is like the end of the kidney. So you can say that this is a very ominous um, um, marker. The good thing is, if we lower proteinuria, we can achieve some improvement. So it is just not a marker, but it's also a risk factor. And by reducing proteinuria, we can achieve some benefit that I want to show you in the next couple, in the next part of my talk. So what are the treatment options? So this is a time axis beginning in the 80s. And these are some pivotal studies. This slide is modified from Professor Wanner, who is an expert in this field. And in the 80s, high blood pressure was identified as a progression factor, and lowering blood pressure was found to be beneficial. Everybody will agree on this. Then glycemic control is protective. This was studied in several this was seen in several studies, but the evidence, the best evidence was maybe the advanced study. Then it, found, it was found that RAS blockade is protective, first with captopril, then with the Zartans and the Orient st study. And then nothing happened. 15 years, in the last 15 years, there was no progress, and we used to treat the patient with a tight blood pressure control, tight glycemic control, and a RAS blockade. Until in the next, in the last two or three years, we have four very promising studies with two new substance classes pro promising really improvement on top on this th treatment. So the, 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 pivot, the point is that these studies are on top of treatments which are already um, protective. And now in the further talk, I want to show you the data on these studies. So the leader study was a study with liraglutide a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist, and it has improved the endpoint macroalbuminuria. So the progression from microalbuminuria to macroalbuminuria was reduced significantly. But it did not prevent the incidence of dialysis or the doubling of serum creatinine. So it was confined to this lab laboratory surrogate. What could be the mechanism of liraglutide? Maybe it's related to its effect on hypoglycemia, on better glucose control, maybe on glomerular hypertension, systemic hypertension. But no, obviously no um, specific um, mode of action. What about the SGLT2 inhibitors? These are drugs which have really a, a specific and special mode of action. They are renal anti-diabetics. They have no extra renal effects. And Nephrologists like it instantaneously, this, this substance, because it's lowering the blood glucose via glucose excretion up to 70 grams, independent from the insulin action. And at the same time, we must not forget, we have also excretion of sodium. And we know that sodium is a big problem to these patients. Sodium retention triggers hypertension, triggers much of the cardiovascular risk. And this drug is, is aiming this... Um, sodium retention as well, so we have a, a, a bullet uh, aiming at two critical components of diabetic disease, glucose and sodium. So the, the cardiovascular outcome studies showed that maybe SGLT2 inhibitors might be protective in preventing the progression of nephropathy, doubling of serum creatinine, start of renal replacement therapy, even death, incident albuminuria, with a hazard ratio of 0.61. That means 39% risk reduction on top of the pre-existing treatment. These studies were not definitive uh, um, evidence because the renal outcomes were secondary endpoints. Also, for, this was also shown for canagliflozin. Also, a, a cardiovascular safety study showing as a secondary outcome that the same um, I, um, out, um, endpoints were positively affected. So that's why 
there was a new study with renal endpoints as the primary endpoint. And this study well, has been published almost one month ago electronically. It's not in the printed um, version of the journal. And this study focused on renal outcomes. It was a prospective study, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, in patients with established diabetic nephropathy. Inclusion criteria were age 30, greater than 30, AB, HbA1c 6.5 to 12, GFR down to 30, high albuminuria as high as 5,000, and a stable dose of a RAS blocker. And people with immunosuppressant treatment or type 1 diabetes were excluded. The, the patients were randomized for the treatment arm one times 100 milligram canaglifosine or placebo. The primary endpoint was the progression to end-stage renal disease, doubling of serum creatinine, and death from renal or cardiovascular cause. The sample size was calculated on the basis of the incidence of 844 events. And there was also a planned interim analysis after the occurrence of the primary endpoint in 405 patients. Altogether, 4,401 patients were randomized out of 12,000 12, screened patients in 690 centers in, from 34 countries. And the study was prematurely terminated last year in July due to a difference higher than 30% in the primary endpoint in favor of patients treated with canagliflozine. The median follow-up at that time was 2.6 years. So this is the patient characteristics. The GFR was 56 in both groups, and the proteinuria in the mean 900. And the range was, the interquartile range was 400 to 1,800, other really proteinuric patients. The age was 62. So these are the couple of Meyer curves for the endpoints separately. So the primary endpoint, which is a composite, you see an immediate dissociation of the curves from the beginning, and the canagliflozin shows a protective effect. So this is on the this is the scale un, until uh, till 100, and this is the according to the values so until still 30. So you see here the real specific composite outcome without um, death was also positively influenced. End-stage kidney disease also reduced incidence, seen in kind of glyphosine treated patients. Also dialysis, transplantation, and renal death. Secondary outcome were the cardiovascular events, and they were also positively affected. So this study merely confirmed what has been um, sh seen in the previous cardiovascular safety studies. In a tabular vision, you can see the events. This is hard to read. The important aspect is that we can calculate the number needed to treat from these data. So it's 22 patients to prevent one case of ESRD, doubling of serum creatinine or renal death, and to, to prevent one hospitalization. And we have to treat 25 pi patients to prevent one cardiovascular death. So these numbers are very low. So for statins, we normally have 30, 40, 50. So 22 is for a single drug in this high-risk community, a very good value in my opinion. Subgroup analysis was done. What is, in my opinion, uh, very interesting is that patients with high proteinuria, high, greater than 1,000 milligram, they had very low hazard ratio. They seem to have a higher um, susceptibility to the protective effect. Also patient with 45 to 60% GFR. So maybe the, these are patients which have a pronounced protective effect. What we have seen, what the uh, investigators saw be, re, with regard to albuminuria is that there is instantaneous, a instantaneously a reduction in albuminuria. And this was prolonged throughout the study. Also with the GFR, there were instantaneous drop in GFR, but then it stabilized with a, a less steeper slope. So this was actually the protective effect of the drug, that the slope here is less steep than this, the slope in the placebo-treated um, patients. And this is very interesting, because it shows that these drugs, they 
act on the glomerular hemodynamics. So how we can explain these uh, very instantaneous effects? We will, I will show you later on. Effect on HBHC and systolic blood pressure shows a drop in glucosylated hemoglobin and also a drop in blood pressure of about four to five millimeters of mercury. What about the adverse effects? We have seen now many positive effects. What is the price we have to pay for these good uh, effects? Are, is there any price to pay? Is there any increased risk signal? And to our for, fortunately, there are no, in, no risk signals. So amputation, which was, which was associated with canagliflozin, was not increased. And also from a nephrologist point of view, the incidence of acute kidney injury was also not increased. So these are really safe. This drug seems to be a very safe one. Diabetic ketoacidosis 11 in 2000 compared to one in 2000. So a very minimal signal maybe here, but this did not reach statistical significance. So here I want to show you the, the explanation for the drop in albuminuria and GFR starting from the beginning of uh, this treatment. So diabetes causes glomerular hypertension. So we have higher glucose, we have higher glucose reabsorption, and with this, with the increased uh, sodium glucose transport, sodium disappears from the tubulus. That means the sodium reaching the distal tubule is reduced, and the macula densa, which is sensing the distal tubule, the sodium is activated. And the body thinks that there might be a depletion of salt, and that's why it starts to, to vasodilate the vas efferents to increase fi filtration. And this causes glomerular hypertension. And this is a trigger for kidney growth, which we can see microscopically, and also for a higher proteinuria and albuminuria. So GFR goes up and also proteinuria. So if we give a SGLT2 inhibitor, then we block the reabsorption, and more sodium can reach the distal tubule, activating the macula densa reflex, the tubular glomerular feedback reflex. This leads to a vasoconstriction of the, vas of the afferent arteriole and of a reduction of blood pressure in the glomerulus, the, the intraglomerular pressure. And that's why we have a reduction in albuminuria and also maybe a little bit reduction in the GFR. But the effects on proteinuria, albuminuria are much more pronounced. And this principle seems to be nephroprotective. So if you sum it up, if we want to really protect the kidney in a diabetic, diabetic patient, we give a RAS blockade which activates, which inhibits the effects of angiotensin on the afferent arteriole, opens it up, and lowers the pressure. With the SGLT2 inhibitors, we act on the afferent arteriole and cause a small amount of vasoconstriction. And at the end, we have a reduced intraglomerular pressure. And this principle, this is nephroprotective. So it's uh, not a biochemical chemical aspect. I think it's much more related to this pressure-related uh, issue. And the surrogate for the, the, the action of this drug is the albuminuria, which you can see, which is um, dropping in these patients. So that's why I want to conclude at this point that diabetic nephropathy is diagnosed by the presence of albuminuria greater than 300 milligrams per gram creatinine in the presence of long-standing diabetes an absence of signs for renal disease of other etiology. That's something sometimes difficult to, to really uh, decide upon non-invasive testing. In, in case of suspicion, we would pr um, prefer a biopsy. In addition to glycemic control, optimal blood pressure, and rigorous reduction of proteinuria are, are established treatment goals. That means we look at the HbA1c, we look at the blood pressure, and we look at the proteinuria, these three, and within this triangle, we want to optimize our treatment. In addition to cardioprotective effects, which will be also discussed later, SGLT2 inhibitors seem to have strong nephroprotective effects beyond glycemic control and beyond RAS blockade. 
I thank you for your attention. I am happy to take your questions. Thank you, Professor, for the excellent update on diabetic nephropathy. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yes. Dr. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I, could I ask, does glycosuria from SGLT2 differ from glycosuria of poorly controlled diabetes? <clears throat> In first impression, I would not say that it is. I mean, the, the soldier maybe it's the difference. I mean, SGLT2 inhibited patients, they have also redu um, ex ex increased increasing of sodium. So the glycosuria of, of the diabetic patient who has a stimulated SGLT2 may be different because normally the SGLT2 is induced in diabetes. So the body st wants to hold the glucose actually back. So this is maybe a difference that, um, but for the whole balance of the patient, I mean, with SGLT2 inhibition, you induce a calorie reduction, so a, a, a negative energy uh, balance. In a diabetic, diabetic patient with glucosuria due to overflow, he's still not in a negative calorie balance. Maybe that's also part of the effect on the weight. You know, that they lose weight three kilograms. Yes, yeah, I mean, this, it's a sodium. I mean, it's the sodium that, that one has to, if you, one has to um, assume that more sodium is reaching, and actually there are some um, kidney st uh, studies in, in, in rats. If you have increased SGLT2, then you have less sodium in the tubular lumen. So that's why the macular densa is activated. Yes, please. recommend uh, small doses of uh, AC inhibitors and SGLT2 in order to protect the kidney? And would you be afraid of any uh, electrolyte imbalance? Actually, these data show us that we, we must not be afraid because these patients, they all had, they had rust blockade at baseline because it is, you cannot, perform a study in diabetic nephropathy without having all patients treated with optimal blood pressure control, optimal glycemic control, optimal rust blockade. So this is on top. So this is actually more exciting to learn that this treatment can be protective, adding another 30% of uh, protection. And this study also shows that it, it seems to be safe. So acute kidney, kidney injury was not increased, although we compromised the intrarenal glomerular hemodynamics so, um, but still, these patients, they need to be, we need to gather our experience. We know that the diuretics cause need acute renal injury, rust blockade. So, when the patient loses too much volume due to high weather or so, then maybe there, this should, might be different. But actually, in a normal setting, it is, it is not, there is not any risk. Any other question? I have a small comment. We in the know Yes, that there are significant, very significant variations in uh, between patients uh, in the response, uh, in the rate of diabetic nephropathy progression and in the response to treatment, to every treatment, even in RAS inhibition. And uh, this suggests that uh, the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms are all not the same in all patients that probably are not the same in all the stages of diabetic nephropathy. That means that too, we need to improve the prediction of high-risk patients to, to be more, uh, for more intensified treatment. And moreover, I believe there is an unmet need for more biopsies in diabetics. So I believe that we agree that we need uh, that uh, diabetologists and internists should refer more easily their patients for to nephrologists for evaluation and possibly for renal biopsy. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Previous studies have shown that up to up to 50% of diabetic uh, patients do not have diabetic nephropathy, but either. Uh, 
another non-diabetes uh, renal disease or non-diabetes renal di diabetic renal disease superimposed on diabetic nephropathy. What is your yes, I agree yeah. that uh, that maybe we biopsy too less and maybe there are some surprises which we can also see. But actually regarding risk mark, I mean the, the best risk mark is still albuminuria and we have very good exactly. data as you, have, you see. So albuminuria higher than 1,000 maybe. It is, and we have good data, uh, and it will be it will be hard to to have a beer marker even better than this. So I think. I agree with you. Okay. So I think. Okay. Thank you again for the excellent talk, and let's continue.